what Leadership 113 is. It's really part of our discipleship journey. It's actually a 10-month online course on leadership, theology, uh, apologetics. Uh, you've got Old Testament survey, New Testament survey, so on and so forth, spiritual disciplines. About 65 small group leaders and interns join us from our three congregations in Alabang, Paranaque, and Las Piñas. And these interns and these people really wanted to have an opportunity to deepen their foundations and their faith in God. And I believe that there's no better time to learn and get equipped than during this pandemic. I know that, yeah, maybe we don't have much time, but maybe we do. Uh, we have an opportunity in online learning. And so I believe this is the best opportunity for us to establish ourselves, deepen ourselves in our faith. And how many of you know that in this time of pandemic, we need greater faith? We're already one and a half years into this pandemic and this worldwide economic crisis. Everybody is going through tough times. How many of you would agree with me on that? And that's where we get this title for this sermon today, Through Tough Times. It's not going away from tough times. It's not praying away the tough times from us, but it's actually going through tough times. I think it was uh, Robert Schuller who said a very familiar statement, tough times never last but tough people do. My question is, are we tough enough to go through the tough times? Tough times, afflictions, trials, they never last. They are temporary. How many of you agree with me on that? They are temporary. You know, if you're with your family, just tell the person beside you, temporary. That word temporary, if you're, you know, type, you're, you have the ability to type on the chat, just type temporary. Afflictions, tough times, they're temporary. But the tough people of God with resolute faith, they would last. Is it possible for us to overcome in this pandemic? Is our faith strong enough to stand firm against any adversity, difficulty, whether in this pandemic, during this pandemic, or even beyond this pandemic? How many of you know that this pandemic will also come to an end? We'll all go back to, you know, wherever, whatever it is that we're doing. Uh, I don't know, maybe two years, three I don't know, or when that will be. But right after that, you know, there will still be tough times. In fact, in this pandemic, we're going through a tsunami of pain and loss and grief. Sickness, death of family member, loss of job. Maybe you yourself, you're sick. Maybe you lost opportunity in your business, you know, I think the uh, other day, we just had another record-breaking number of cases for COVID, uh, more than 19,000 new cases uh, in the Philippines. And that's probably the highest that we've ever had during this pandemic, even from the start of this pandemic. And some people are asking, is this it? You know, there's a US TV show or series that I watched before. Uh, entitled Doomsday Preppers. You're probably familiar with that TV show. Uh, Doomsday Preppers. These are people who are apocalyptic. They expect difficult times to happen. And so they are prepping for the end of the world. You know how they prepare? They prepare in different ways, like building a bunker in a remote uh, place, like digging underground. They're stockpiling food, water, uh, medicine, in fact, they stockpile even armaments, guns, bombs, batteries, generators, and other essentials, making themselves ready for D-Day or Doomsday. You know, if there are end-time preppers right now, what about us, the church, the people of God? Are we faith preppers? What are we doing to get ready for the big day? And how do we you know, how, you know, how do we toughen up our faith that's really designed for tough times? How do we develop a mountain-moving faith? How do we help others grow in their faith? These are some of the questions that we'd like to address in our sermon or in our message today. And if you are here joining me today, uh, I'd like to invite you to open up our Bibles to, uh, once again, 1 Thessalonians, we are in the middle of our series on 1 Thessalonians. We are week number three. We've finished in a couple of weeks, Thessalonians 1. Last week we did two, and today we're going to be reading from Thessalonians chapter 3. 
So why don't you go ahead and open up to Thessalonians chapter 3, and we'll be reading uh, only five verses this day. And uh, I am reading from the ESV version, English Standard Version. Therefore, when we could bear no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in the faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has to come or to pass and just as you know. Verse 5, For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Let's just bow our heads right now and commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the power of your word. Your word encourages, your word gives life, your word changes, it transforms, and it actually puts new courage in our hearts. I pray, God, that you would allow us to be ready uh, in times of afflictions and adversity and hardships and testings. May your name be honored today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. All right, what an interesting topic. And I'm pretty sure that it is not a very popular topic that you would like to hear on a normal Sunday morning. Just to give us a, a, a quick background, you know, if you're joining us today and you've missed a couple of weeks, you know, this particular letter of Paul to Thessalonians, um, you know, the authors were not, uh, it's, it's not just Paul, but Paul, Timothy, and Silas. They preached the gospel in Thessalonica for a very short time about, I think about three Sabbaths, according to the scripture in Acts chapter 17, the word was preached. Uh, it was very powerful and effective. It produced a lot of disciples, and eventually a church was birthed. However, some people instigated a riot, and this forced the Apostle Paul and the whole company to leave the city, and they went to the cities of Berea and Athens, Greece. Now, while in Athens, uh, you know, a few months later, uh, Paul was concerned with the new believers because he's heard that there's like persecution, hardships, difficulties happening in the church back there in Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonica or Thessalonica. And so what he did was he had to send back Timothy to the church in order to strengthen them. And this is where we pick up from this particular letter today. Paul was left alone in Athens. And the young believers were facing opposition, they're facing adversity. Uh, it's almost like a fact that, you know, I really understand that, you know, we as believers, as Christians, the moment we become Christians, the moment we became converted to Christianity, guess what? There will be persecution. There will be opposition. How many of you have experienced that? Uh, you have probably gone through that phase of, you know, you're so excited to share your faith to your family members, to your office mates, to your classmates, and guess what? Instead of them being excited with you and for you, they persecute you, they mock you, and they tell you names and so on and so forth. And then suddenly you go through difficulties in life and you thought that, I thought that faith in Christ would bring blessings instead of hardships. But the reality is our life really is about two things. Blessings and testings. Blessings and testings. Yes, God promised blessings. He was the one who, you know, the first Sermon on the Mount was called the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes means blessings of God. But yet we also know that part of what Jesus Christ did and taught was about the cross. And what He said was, if any of you would be a disciple, that you are to uh, follow Him and pick up your cross daily and be ready for hardships. Now, how do we become faith preppers? I want to share three thoughts from what we have read today. Number one, we must be established or we must establish believers in the faith. And you know, one of the things that we would love for our church uh, to, to have is that we would actually just be able to prepare them for the things to come. 
uh, we will see that in the scripture we've read is, therefore, when we could bear no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens, and we sent Timothy, our brother and co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and to exhort you in the faith. In the NIV, it says to strengthen and to encourage you in the faith. You know, Paul was so concerned that he sent Timothy back to them from Athens in order that Timothy might establish and exhort and comfort them in their faith. And it's interesting that uh, the NIV used the word strengthen and encourage. Now, how many of you need strengthening and encouragement in this time of pandemic? I believe that all of us would raise up our hands, double hands. We need strengthening. We need encouragement uh, every single day. For those of you moms who are, you know, full-time uh, mothers in the house, dads who are caring for your kids, working, uh, you know, students who are doing online learning, single professionals who are still going out, and so on and so forth, medical workers, uh, who are serving in the medical community and you're seeing the cases rise, how many of you know that we're going through a most difficult time in history of humanity in our generation? And we need to be strengthened. To strengthen means to reinforce. It's almost like putting in the opportunity or to the elements in making a cement strong and firm. And to encourage is to call to one side or to put courage in, or to come alongside someone like a coach. We need one who would encourage us. We need someone who would in, uh, strengthen us in the faith. And if we are established in the faith, then no matter what happens, we will be firm in our walk. We will not be shaken, but yet we will be comforted in any and in different adverse circumstances. You know, it's so important for us to be established in the faith because when we are established in the faith, you know, as when architects or contractors, uh, you know, they have buildings, they, they con con uh, construct them, you know, they are steady in times of earthquake. When we are established in the faith, our walk will not be wobbly. We will be strong. We will be firm. You know, um, it was of a sad news, uh, you know, I want to share, and I ask the permission of uh, my dear friends, Roman and uh, Rika Mojica, if I can share their story. Um, you know, in the middle of June, we heard the sad news that their baby, Titus, got sick uh, of, uh, you know, accidentally uh, swallowed something. They rushed into the hospital. Eventually, he developed pneumonia. A few days later, when they thought that he was doing okay, he suddenly developed into a bad pneumonia, and eventually he passed away. It was a very sad, tragic news uh, that we have heard. Titus was about eight months uh, at that time, and I think uh, they just celebrated his first birthday. Uh, and, you know, we stood with them. Uh, we prayed for them. We were there. Me and Shirley wanted to encourage the family. But when we were talking to Roman and Rika, we were the ones getting encouraged because of the faith that they had. You know, they said this, they may not totally understand what happened, but they decided to trust in the goodness and in the sovereignty of God. You know, God is still good even if circumstances seem bad. And the message of Roman to me, and if you can just, uh, you know, put back their uh, family picture, you know, was during that time of the memorial service, is that they would have the opportunity to minister to their family members and to their friends. And what an interesting prayer that Roman shared to me when he said, Lord, may you use Titus for your glory. We dedicate him to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Roman told me how this trial has brought them closer as a family. And you see the family photo. I asked for permission if I can share this. And even the way the kids have responded, it's amazing. Uh, you know, Cruz, the eldest son, is almost a teenager now, and he has shown tremendous maturity, and Roman believes that even this loss of Titus, the brother, has also contributed to that maturity. You know, we all go through difficulties. We all through, go through difficult moments, and you, we've, we've stood alongside this family, but I am just grateful for the opportunity for me to learn 
uh, to, 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 uh, to be able to share this a moment with Roman and Vika and how they have actually brought out how they have been established in the faith and their heart to be able to share still the love of God to others. Second point is we are destined for afflictions. Now, this may not be a nice point that you would like to take note of. How can we be destined for afflictions? Isn't afflictions like optional? Isn't afflictions or difficulties or uh, hardship or trials just something that you can actually go and check in the tick box? If you want it, then you can have it. If you don't want it, then you can skip it. Is it like a multiple choice for Christianity that affliction can actually be there or in some point it cannot be there? Now let me just read once again what the Apostle Paul wrote in verse 3. What he said was that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are what? Destined for this. What? Paul, are you sure when you were writing, you were inspired by the Holy Spirit when you were writing this? Are you sure and are you positive that we are destined for afflictions? That we are destined for trouble and hardships and difficulties? And then he went on, he continued his writing. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. The Apostle Paul reminded them that he had told them in advance, you know, when he was still preaching to them in the, in the synagogue, that he would face trials, persecution, afflictions, that it will come, and that he was warning them also that it will come to you as well. It was appointed for us to go through trials and afflictions and hardships and tribulations. We are destined for afflictions. Afflictions are to be, are to be expected. No one is exempted. You know, let me just say that again. Afflictions are to be expected. And no one, no one is exempted. You know, adversity is not an accident. I believe it's a divine appointment. When we face difficulty, when we face trial, when we face an adversity, I believe that the Holy Spirit is working in us and through us. It's a divine appointment. And so we are destined for trouble. You know, some of you are probably having a difficult time receiving this message. And let me tell you this. I am just echoing the words of the Apostle Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I would rather tell you the truth so that it can prepare us in times like this. In fact, no less than the Master Himself, our Savior, our Redeemer, Christ. Jesus said this, John chapter 16, verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus promised. In fact, He said this as a matter of fact, that in this world, and how many of you are in the world? You're not in Mars, you're not in the moon, you're not in space. You're in the world. You're here right now in this world as long as we have breath in our lungs, as long as we're alive. In this world, guys, church, brothers and sisters, let me speak to you as a pastor, as a friend, as a spiritual father. We will have difficulties in this life. This pandemic is just a proof of that. In other words, you know, if I may quote the author of the Message Bible, Eugene Peterson, he said this, to be human is to be in trouble. Can you imagine that? How many of you are human beings? If you are human, it's to be in trouble. It's almost like a calling that God has designed for us to go through in this life because of the flesh, because of the body that we live in. In fact, a Christian is a person who decides to face and live through suffering. If we're believers, if we're followers of Jesus, when Jesus said, pick up your cross daily and follow me, you know, we're to be ready to pick up our crosses every single day and die to ourselves. You know, this is not a very popular message. You know, Maybe some of you don't want to hear this type of sermon. Okay, I just saw five people leave YouTube right now. Another 10 in Facebook. I'm just kidding, okay? 
We'd rather hear messages on blessings, prosperity, grace, you know, uh, help or encouragement. Many times we have misconceptions of what afflictions are for. Some people think that it's a judgment of God. Maybe. We think that God is angry at us, so He is making life difficult for us. Is that the way we view our good Father? Some people think that they are being punished for the sins that they have done in the past and it's catching up on them. Now, why is there suffering in the first place? What's the purpose of adversity? You know, I believe that God sends adversity to develop us and not to bring us down. Once again, God sends adversity to develop us and not to bring us down. I believe it was A.W. A Tozer that says, uh, God cannot use a man greatly until he has been broken deeply. And if God wants to use each and every one of us, then the process of breaking has to come in us. God normally breaks a vessel, that's us, before He can use us and reshape us and pour His anointing and His blessing upon us. Imagine yourself like a pot. You know, we are earthly vessels, the Bible says, and ha God has to allow us to be broken so that He can actually strengthen us and mold us again, and then He would pour out His grace, His blessing, His anointing, and then use us for its noble purposes. It was James in chapter 1 that said this, Consider it pure joy, one of my favorite memory verses. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. You know, going through difficult times and trials and adversity, I realize, makes us complete in Christ. It's not having a girlfriend. It's not having a boyfriend. It's not getting married. It's not getting that dream job. It's not going to a nice vacation that completes us. It's actually going through difficulties and hardships, and adversities that complete us so that we may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. When we go through hardships and adversity and trials, let me just say this, we are not being punished, but our faith is being tested. Our faith is being tested. And this testing of our faith is the one that produces perseverance. You know, uh, I'm not an engineer or a tech or someone who is in the manufacturing, but yet I'm familiar that when products, before they launch it in the market, they are tested. They have to pass a certain quality mark before they are released in the market. Whether it's your iPhone or maybe your Samsung Galaxy or your smart TV or even a car or a vehicle, they have to go through tests. A product has to go through what you call a reliability test. And there are two kinds of testings that they have to go through. First test is the HALT, or the Highly Accelerated Life Test, or the HALT. It basically determines the lifespan or the duration of a certain product. And the second test that it has to go through is the HAST, HAST which means Highly Accelerated Stress Test. And this examines a product's endurance under extreme conditions like vibration, temperature, uh, wet test, humidity, drop test, number test, a cycle, and you know, the duration of a product. And the whole purpose of this is not to destroy a product. The whole purpose is to determine preventive measures that can increase the product's reliability and lifespan and how it could be adjusted back in the production line. Guess what? As believers, as Christians, we all go through different tests in life. There's what you call the adversity test, what we're going through right now. How many of you have gone through an offense test? You've been offended, and God is testing you the way you would respond if you would forgive. Promotion test, you're waiting for this promotion, and then it did not come. Or maybe you've been promoted, and how do you respond to that promotion? Whether you become proud or arrogant. Blessing test. How many of you know that even blessings can sometimes be testings? That when God blesses us, the question is, will we be faithful to Him or we forget Him? Sometimes when extreme blessings do come, people tend to forget God. 
or the waiting test. How many of you are in the middle of the waiting test, right? You're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for this sermon to be over. No, just kidding. Okay, sickness test. How many of you are going through that? Patience test, relationship test, or what I don't like is the failure test. We don't want to be failures, but yet sometimes God allows failures to happen in our life. And He allows us to be tested even through those. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 4 says, Not only that we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces what? Produces hope. The attitude of Paul is not to complain in the middle of sufferings, but to rejoice in sufferings. Can we find it in ourselves to still find the joy of the Lord in the middle of a painful situation that we're going through right now? The story of Rika and Roman is such a proof that God is working in their heart. I have another friend, uh, you know, dear friend, a small group, uh, I'm not going to mention them because I was not able to ask their permission. But, you know, they're going through a tough time financially in the business. And they trusted the Lord. They've honored God in the way they handled their finances. They honored the Lord in the way they actually uh, taken care of their manpower and their, their people. However, because of this pandemic, their business came to a slump or a halt. But they continued on to hold on to the Lord and glorify God even in the midst of difficulties economically. Suffering will produce endurance and then character and then hope. And hope is what we need to outlast the afflictions that we're facing right now and this suffering that we're going through. You know, if you want to have a basic definition of hope, hope is this. Hope is the confident expectation of what hasn't happened yet, but it will. That's hope. We hope in some, you know, and hope is not kesera sera. It's not, you know, I, I wish, you know. It's a confident expectation of what hasn't come yet, but it will. It's always looking for the goodness of God. We know that our Redeemer, our Savior lives and that good things will come out of all these testings. You know, even Peter has written things about difficulties. And he said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, I'm reading from the NLT version, New Living Translation, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange in your neighborhood. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, something strange are happening to you. Don't be surprised as if it's something strange that's happening right now. Afflictions are not an accident. There are divine appointments. God wants to meet us in the middle of our fire. Remember the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were thrown in the fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar. And when the king looked at them, they were not three, they were four. Because there was a son of man who was with them through the fire. Trials either make you or break you. Adversity will make you better or Will it make you bitter? Is our faith ready to be tested? It's not, really, it's not really a matter of if our faith will be tested, but when our faith will be tested. You know, I, I, sometimes you know, I'm, I'm really asking the Lord, Lord, to help us to be ready for testings. Because, you know, when trials and hardships and difficulties come, it's as if that these trials are saying, ready or not, here I come. My, my, my question is, is our faith ready? That's why in verse 5 it says, The Apostle Paul, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith. For fear that somehow the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. He was concerned about the young faith of the Thessalonian church. God uses tough times and trials to strengthen our faith. But you know, Satan also uses tough times to generate doubt, fear, unbelief, and even disillusionment of God. God uses afflictions to bring courage, whereas the enemy uses hardships to discourage us. 
Now, how many of you can relate with this? You know, that sometimes you can actually be weary and discouraged because of all these things happening to us. It is a human tendency to be discouraged. And you're not to be, you know, found uh, uh, yeah, so condemned with that. But sometimes we just go through tough times and we get discouraged. The devil tempts us to bring out the worst in us, but God tests us to bring out the best in us. Did you know that God will never tempt us? It's the devil that tempts us, J James chapter 1 says. But God tests us. And the enemy wants to use the afflictions to discourage us and to destroy us. In fact, we are familiar with this verse, you know, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, SKD. That's his job description. But Jesus comes, John chapter 10, verse 10, he comes to give us life, and life to the full, and even toughen us up in the most difficult situations. Third and final point is remain strong in the faith as you go through tough times. Yes, tough times are always there in the horizon, but we got to be strong. We got to hold fast. We got to hang in there. In Tagalog, alam naman nila si sabi, di ba? Kapit ka lang, best. Di ba? Kapit. Don't ever let go. Hold fast. In verse 6, it says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us, I'd like to read, uh, and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. You know, Timothy has come back from Thessalonica and he has given a good report to Paul about the faith of this young church. In fact, they long to see the church face to face. How many of you know that we long to see the church face to face here also? You know, it's interesting that Paul mentioned this in chapter 2 and now he's mentioning this again in chapter 3. That, you know, in, in verse, uh, uh, yeah, long to see you, okay? Uh, we, we can't wait. We, want, we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in our distress, our affliction, we have been comforted uh, about you through your faith. And it was the Apostle Paul that was comforted. The faith of the Thessalonians, can you imagine? They brought comfort and encouragement to Paul and Silas. It was the apostles, it was the pastors that founded the church, but the young church brought encouragement to them. What a great encouragement to know that those who you're ministering to are going ahead in our faith. And that is really our heart and our desire as pastors and as believers and as leaders of the church. We would love to see the young believers, our leaders, our interns, our volunteers, even our young uh, uh, members in the church to be able to grow and continue on despite the fact that all these things are happening to us and to them. It brings us great joy and encouragement. And guess what? God comforts us in our pain so that we can comfort others with the comfort that we have received or that we have been given. God is a God of comfort, number one. And I believe that when God comforts us, He will use that same comfort to comfort others because the greatest ministry will come out of your deepest pain. Let me say that again. The greatest ministry will come out of your deepest pain. And whatever it is that you're going through, you know, many of you have uh, heard about me and my family who have lost our son, me and Shirley. And this particular event and trial in our life has actually allowed us to be able to uh, minister to others who have also lost uh, loved ones in their family. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 8 says, For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. And the apostle is not only calling this the good news, as he mentioned in verse 6. Uh, you know, this is the same word as in the gospel. What he's saying is, you know, he found the real meaning of life for them, seeing the believers becoming strong in their faith in God. You know, we, what he's saying is, wow, this is life, for now we live. Now we are alive because we see you standing in your faith. You know, the same is true with us here in Victory, the pastors. You know, when we see the believers continue to walk in their faith in the Lord, when we see the members 
no matter how young they are, they're going through difficulties, their trials, but yet they continue to decide to honor God despite the fact that they're going through all these difficulties. Apostle John said this, I have no greater joy than to see my children walking in the truth. And I can actually say that. And I can actually borrow that from the Apostle John. I have no greater joy than to see our church members, our spiritual children, our uh, spiritual babes in the Lord, walking in the truth in the middle of all this situation and difficulties. Each of us really live when we see our brothers and sisters live out their faith in God. In the church, we, have the, we share the same joy as the Apostle Paul. I know that, yes, times are tough. We've gone through many funerals in the past months, more than a year already, and I, don't, I can't imagine the, the pain and the grief and the sorrow that our church has gone through. We've officiated memorial services left and right, sometimes twice, three times in a day. But yet, we're so amazed on the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's why we share the same joy as the Apostle Paul. We thrive when we see people growing in the faith in the midst of all these difficulties. You know, this pandemic is affliction in epic proportion. And that's an understatement. No one has seen this. No one was prepared for this. We were never ready for this. And it's easy to give up. It's easy to just throw in the towel, to quit, blame God, be bitter at life. But always remember this, church. God is always good even when life seems bad. He'll never change in His character and His nature of being a good father to us. He cares for us. He sympathizes with our weakness. He walks with us. He holds our hand when we are frail and weak. He's always there in the middle of our grief, and pain, and sorrow. Let's receive that from the Holy Spirit right now. I believe the Holy Spirit is just breathing a new life in you. James chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God promised to those who love him. You know, we are called to stay strong under pressure. And what I'm excited for is for us, not just the pastors, but for each one of us who overcomes. God promised a crown of life when we overcome. Not just to hear the words of the master, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master, but upon saying that, God will give us a crown of life when we overcome. You know, if you follow me on uh, social media, you probably have learned that I love coffee. And I love brewing different kinds of coffee. I like doing different brew methods, whether it's French press or AeroPress or just the regular drip. Or, you know, sometimes I use our coffee machine uh, so that I can actually have a nice cup of coffee. But, you know, when you use a coffee machine, you can actually have coffee in about 30 seconds or a minute coffee's ready. But my favorite method of coffee making is the pour-over coffee. You know, in the pour-over coffee, you know, for those of you who don't, you're familiar with coffee, you know, you have to, I, I take it to the extreme. You know, I have a weighing scale, I have, you know, a, a brewing method, I have like a Hario, you know, uh, uh, what do you call this, a filter, and I have a, a, a pot, a, a, actually a gooseneck uh, uh, pot, and what I enjoy about this method is the flavor is great and the aroma is amazing. And it takes me about five minutes or so to do that. And why do I enjoy this type of coffee? It's because of the process that is involved in making this cup. I could go shortcut and go to a coffee machine and enjoy my coffee right away. But I enjoy this kind of coffee because of the process. It may take a, a little bit longer, 
but it's the process that makes the coffee better tasting. Guess what? Even in our life, I want to encourage you, church, trust in the process of God in your life. It's the process of God that will make our life even better smelling before the Lord. I'd like to read this final verse, Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. It says, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. You know, my main point I want to share and then we're going to come to a close is our tested faith becomes a sweet aroma to God and to others. Our tested faith becomes a sweet aroma to God and to others. You know, we're going to have a time of prayer, but I just want us to just take a short time to just honor the Lord and just worship Him. And then we're going to come back. And I want to pray for each of you that you will be strong in the faith as you go through all this. Let's just worship right now. You command the winds to fade. You still my heart with your embrace. You command the winds to fade. You still my Father, we acknowledge that you are the peace in our hearts. Shalom, Irene. Nothing missing, nothing broken. And I thank you, Lord God, that even for those of us who are worshiping right now and joining us in this service, I just pray, God, that you would, Lord, provide your peace and your comfort and your grace in the midst of this difficult situation that they're going through. I pray, God, that you would establish us in the faith so that we would be strong in the middle of all these testings and trials. Lord, I pray, God, that you would impart a fresh level of faith upon them right now. That they would also, Lord, allow themselves to be anchored in the Word every single day. That they would look to you. And, Lord, just like the deer pants for water, so their soul longs for you, God. I pray, God, there's going to be a desperation of more of the presence of God in their daily life. Father, help us to look at afflictions in a different perspective as opportunities to grow in our faith, in our walk in the Lord. I pray, God, that you would allow your people to be encouraged, God. Lord, we declare that indeed God is always good even if life seems so bad because you are a faithful God. You will never change. 
you are always faithful and true to your word, God. And help us to stand firm in our faith. Help us to hold fast in the calling and in the purpose that you have given to each and every one of us. Father, I thank you that even right now that you would bring healing in our hearts. Physical healing for those who are sick. Provision for those who are waiting for provision. Opportunities for those who are in need of finances, God. I pray for restoration in relationships, God. Use this situation, Lord, to be able to bring us closer to one another and appreciate the life that you have given to us. As long as there's breath in our lungs, may every word that comes out of our mouth, God, comes out of our mouth, be pleasing and glorifying to you, Lord. And if you are joining us today and if you don't know Jesus yet and you don't have a relationship with Him, you know, the most difficult thing to go through right now in this pandemic is to have no relationship with God. The reason why we can actually become steady in our walk with the Lord in the midst of all this trial and suffering and afflictions and adversity is because of our relationship with our God, our rock and our Savior. And I'd like to invite you right now, if you want to receive Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, why don't you go ahead and pray this prayer with me? Just repeat alongside, uh, repeat uh, with me. Uh, Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Help me to comprehend and understand your deep love for me because you have gone to the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. I confess that Jesus is my Lord and I also believe that He is raised from the dead. Lord, I thank You that from this day on, my sins have been forgiven and I now have a new relationship with You, my Christ, my Savior, my Redeemer, my Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, if you pray that prayer, congratulations. Today is the first day of your eternal life. And we'd love to be able to hear your story. We'd love to connect with you. And if you have a chance, go ahead and click on or maybe just look for the, uh, in, in the website, victoryalabang.church slash connect. And uh, we would love to be able to connect and pray with you because this is the most important decision that anyone could ever make in his life. And I'm going to just pray for you as we end with a final benediction. Father, thank you so much for your grace upon your people today. I declare, God, that the God of peace himself would sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because he who calls us is faithful and he will surely do it. Bless everyone, God, today, even as they spend their time with their families and as we start a new week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. See you next week. Thank you.